everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded presentations by former senior U.S. intelligence officers and those who record their great accomplishments. We have a very interesting guest today. And to help me co-host, permit me to uh, reintroduce Mr. David Priest. David is a former senior CIA analyst and PDB briefer. We actually had David on uh, the program earlier in the season, and he presented his great book about the history of the PDB entitled The President's Book of Secrets. David, welcome back to AFIO Now. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be back and especially to talk to our guest today. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing to those of you who do not already know him, Dr. Vince Houghton. Uh, Vince got his master's and PhD in diplomatic and military history from the University of Maryland and served in the U.S. Army, uh, particularly in the Balkans. And it's not that exposure to intelligence that is perhaps how most of you know him. He has served as the historian and curator of the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. for many years, and recently took on a new role as the director of the National Cryptologic Museum in Maryland. But we're not talking to him about any of that. We're talking to him about the remarkable stories that he pulled together for his first book called Nuking the Moon. And if that sounds a little bit different, that's because it is a little bit different. Vince wrote all about the intelligence schemes and military plans that didn't quite make it, and perhaps for good reason in some cases. And we're going to talk through some of those stories with, with Vince here today. Uh, Vince, welcome. Hi, it's great to be here, David. Yeah. I've got to say, the, the book Nuking the Moon that you wrote has some of the funniest stories about intelligence and military history that that I've ever read. And we're going to walk through just a few of those stories, uh, some of the ones I think are the best, to give people a flavor of the research you did and the writing you did to bring these stories alive. But as we go along, if there's a, a tidbit you want to mention that we haven't hit, feel free to, to jump in at the end. Uh, the book's unusual because most History books are about what happened. That is even a definition of history. And as you note in the introduction to the book, um, you're writing about what ultimately didn't happen. Uh, why did you choose to focus on these plans that never made it to, to full implementation? Uh, you know, the book is not all that serious, but this is actually a, a relatively serious question um, because it's really kind of an epistemological question. Like, how do we know what we know and what can we learn from history? There's a lot of people who argue in debate about how important is history for modern day understanding of the world around us. And I'm I, I just kind of separate myself from a lot of historians who argue, like, if you don't know what happened, then you're, you know, whatever, you're doomed to repeat it or you can't learn a lot from today. I, I think that's. That's overly simplistic. I think that's actually giving historians a little too much credit because what historians tend to do is focus on what happened. And I know where everyone's going, yeah, okay, duh, Vince. You know, that's what history does. But the real way we can learn from history, and this is where I do argue that historians are important, is to become empathetic with those who came before us, is to understand and put ourselves in the shoes of, of our predecessors and try to figure out why they made the decisions that they made. Not necessarily whether decisions were good or bad, because that's that's all really dependent on judgment and historical hindsight. You know, we know the outcomes. You know, we know what actually happened. And so it's unfair for us to judge people in many respects based on what ultimately occurs. I mean, think about D-Day, for example. You know, if a freak storm popped up during D-Day and, and washed the initial invasion force off target and it fails, would we even look at Eisenhower the same way today? He certainly probably would never become president. Uh, you know, and does it change his plan? Does it make it less, you know, good in the end? Uh, well, the outcome would say, sure. That's how historians would tackle that question in many cases. They'd say, well, it failed. And so this is a bad plan. Let's, let's deconstruct why it was a bad plan. I'm more interested in getting into the shoes of decision makers. I'm more interested in understanding why they made the certain decisions that they made. And in that case, outcome really doesn't matter all that much because we can look at plans and policies and things that didn't happen, like I do, and get 
just as important lesson from history as we can from looking at the things that do happen. In fact, I would argue it's a more important lesson because we are able to get rid of those biases that just are ingrained in human beings, right? You know, we, you know, whether it worked or didn't work, whether something turned out well, something turned out badly, it forces us into kind of a judgmental bias. Well, in this case, we're not forced into that, right? Because we don't know the outcome. Other than the outcome was that they were canceled for whatever reason. And, and I made a point to choose policies that weren't canceled because they, they failed. I, you know, I've done interviews before, like it's a book full of failed operations. I'm like, no, none of them failed. Not a single one of them failed. They didn't fail because they never got a chance to in some cases, but we don't know how successful these would have been. And I think that frees us to look at these without this, you know, inherent bias that we do so many other things. So I had a lot of fun with that, right? And it's one of these things where, hey, look, we can actually still learn a lot from these policies and programs that never happened. Uh, because we can be much more empathetic. We can say, why were these people willing to entertain some of these programs that seem so ridiculous to us today? And that helps us understand the environment they lived in. It helps us to understand, you know, the Second World War and the Cold War. Those are the kind of two periods that I chose for this book, uh, much better than we can by just looking at outcome history. Uh, and so, you know, it's a bit of me banging on the table, a la, you know, with my shoe, a la Khrushchev saying, we're doing history wrong. Most people just kind of skim over that and get to the funny stories. But if you really want to kind of take a serious message from this book, it's kind of reevaluating the way that we approach the past. It's, it's saying much more, forget the winners and losers. Let's understand the people. Uh, and understanding the people is how we can actually learn a lot from history because we're not all that different from the people of the past. The technology is very different. So studying Napoleon in 1812 may not help the U.S. Army today all that much. But studying Napoleon as a person in leadership decisions that he made and the fact that he was dealing with a lot of the same problems that modern army leaders are dealing with, fatigue and soldiers and food and tiredness and all these things, certainly what Clausewitz would talk about is the fog of war, uncertainty and battle. And getting inside Napoleon's head and being empathetic with the decisions that he made, not whether they were right or wrong, but why he chose to make certain decisions, I believe is kind of the foundation of, of history. And so this book really kind of, in a very tongue-in-cheek way, tries to shove that in people's faces without pissing too many people off, I hope. Yeah, you really humanize these decision-making processes because um, every single one involved people, and people were making decisions based on what they thought was necessary at the time. In some cases, um, momentous times in history, some of the biggest events in wartime in American history are chronicled here. But of course, these are the things that didn't happen. So most of these stories are either unknown to, to people who haven't delved into the research or relatively unknown. And uh, I'll start with a few of them. I'll ask you to, to share the highlights of, uh, because some of them are a little dark as well, uh, especially the ones that involve animals. Uh, the first one, let's jump right in. We have one story. Yeah, sure. I'm not sure whether this is a really clever eavesdropping method that should have been implemented because it just might have worked or whether this is a case of cruelty to animals and it's a it's a good thing that it stopped uh talk to us about acoustic kitty yeah i mean i think that there's there's not necessarily a, a real binary there i mean i think they can be both um you know what's fun is is i'm um, speaking to afio there might be people out there listening who actually work on this program uh so you know don't write me nasty letters because the way I approach this story uh, is an understanding that we just don't know, you know, the real story here. And in some cases that's true in the book, this is really the kind of the, the biggest example of where there is a probably true story. And then a wonderfully fantastical story. That's probably not true, but so much more fun to tell. Uh, you know, we know for sure that the CIA in the 1960s decided that it needed to up its game when it came to eavesdropping devices. And it just, it realized it had a real problem on its hands. And the problem was, it was very difficult, mainly some partially because of Soviet counterintelligence, but also because of technological limitations to listen in on some of the highest levels of Soviet conversations. And so the CIA said, all right, well, how can we solve this? And the story is that a CIA case officer assigned to Istanbul, Turkey, was kind of just doing his daily chore of staring at the Soviet embassy to see who came and went from the Soviet embassy and just saw an 
influx of stray cats wandering in out of the Soviet compound. Even been in Istanbul, there's cats everywhere. I mean, if you're a cat lover, it's a wonderful place to be. They just walk all over the place and no one cares and pays them any attention unless they're scratching them or giving them food. This person looked at it and realized that cats were walking inside the compound and, and just kind of jumping up on people's laps and was sitting down and in the midst of these very top secret conversations between Soviet generals and diplomatic personnel, he thought, man, wouldn't it be great if we could get a listening device on one of those cats and kind of wrote this up and sent it back. And then someone at CIA said, I've got one better. And the office, you know, the director of, of S&T, uh, which had, you know, it's in its infancy at that point, it only been around for about a decade, still had its kind of youthful vigor and said, why have one on a cat when we can have one inside a cat? So the plan was, uh, and this is truly the operational name, Project Acoustic Kitty was born at CIA, where the idea was let's surgically implant a listening device inside a cat. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have essentially the perfect listening device. Uh, and, and we know for a fact through CIA documents that have been released that this was attempted. Um, and there's kind of this is where the story veers off. Uh, one side of the story, which is probably the true one, which is sadly boring, is that the surgery itself worked. They, they got to the point where they could actually implant a listening device in a cat. And, and the, the, the tail was the antenna and they had a battery pack inside its abdomen. And it actually worked. You know, so that's that's not all that. You know, we can't just blow that off as being not a big deal, because if you think about introducing an electronic listening device inside the ecosystem of it, the interior of a cat, how wet it is and how hot it is and just all the kind of gross stuff involved with 1960s technology, that's actually a pretty huge accomplishment. The problem was you now have a cat with a listening device and anyone who's been around cats for five minutes can realize, great, that cat's going to do whatever the hell it wants to. How, how, how can we possibly train this cat? in order to do what we want it to. And the more kind of moderate story is that they just couldn't get beyond that problem. And they had to cancel the program because they couldn't figure out a way to train a cat. Now, that's one side of the story, but there is another side. And it's another side that, that was um, produced by a former CI officer, uh, some of you may know, um, Victor Marchetti, uh, who was uh, somewhat disgruntled when he left the agency. He wrote the book, The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence, which gives you an idea about what direction he was heading in when it comes to uh, his feelings toward the agency. And he wrote that Acoustic Kitty went much farther than that, that they tried to train the cat, didn't work at first. And so they went in, back in surgically to the cat and rewired its brain. Uh, and you're like, we wired its brain in the 1960s? Well, you have to remember that there's a concurrent program going on at CIA during this time called MK Ultra. And MKUltra was not just LSD mind control. MKUltra was an umbrella program at CIA, which included over 100 different smaller programs, one of which was doping people up on acid and seeing what would happen. But a lot of the other ones dealt with electronic brain stimulation and, and rats and rodents and cats and other things like that. Some of them dealt with all different kinds of psychomedical experimentation. And one of them was... Can we control animals through you know, electronic stimulation? And so this is not so far-fetched that they went back inside and rewired the cat's brain to get it to do whatever we wanted it to. And according to this story, it worked, where the cat could be actually trained to do what we commanded it to do. And this is where the story gets really dark. And, and, and you know, like good you know, trade craft, they decided we're going to test this cat before we send it out on its first operational mission. And the test is where things go bad. According to this side of the story, they drove, well, there's like 15 different variants of this, but the one I like the most is that they drove their super secret spy van up Connecticut Avenue near Embassy Row. Uh, and they identified a park bench in a park across the street where just two men were talking. It wasn't Soviet spies. It wasn't anyone other, just two guys sitting on the bench. Like this is the perfect way to test this out. They hit a couple keys on their computer. They started their, 1960s era spy van technology a warring. They put Acoustic Kitty down on the street, hit enter, and Acoustic Kitty popped up, and, you know, was receiving signals from the spy van, and to their amazement, made a straight beeline for the two men on the bench. And, and so these guys, you can imagine, director of science and technology, they weren't operations guys, they weren't people who were running around the world like James Bond, they were sitting inside a laboratory, they weren't the cool guys, but now... They just created arguably the greatest spy technology in history. 
They're high-fiving each other. They're doing everything but paying attention to what Acoustic Kitty is doing crossing the street and certainly not paying attention to traffic. And the sad end to the Acoustic Kitty story, at least this variant of it, is our feline hero got halfway across the street before it got run over by a DC cab. Mm. And uh, thus ended that program. And to add insult to injury, you have a sparking CIA Robo Kitty now on Connecticut Avenue that the CIA guys can't just leave. And so they've got to go scrape the roadkill off the street before either the Soviets or, God forbid, the Washington Post uh, find out what's going on. Uh, no more high fives, no more dreams of vacation houses and promotions. Now they've got to go back to headquarters and explain what happened to their multi million dollar project. Uh, it's so a, it's, it's quite yeah. a story, Vince. I mean, it it's the kind of thing that you could almost imagine happening if 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 that variant is true and if that test went well, this this could have been a a stellar eavesdropping advice in the right circumstances. Well, and that, and that's the thing, right? That's why I say these aren't failed programs because this is a program that was canceled because of kind of failures along the way. But the idea itself made a ton of sense. Yeah. I mean, you can look at. Wikipedia of all places or other things online where since Acoustic Kitty, there have been numerous stories of spy animals in one way or another. Now, half of them are probably garbage stories, but some of them are certainly potentially true. Uh, none to the level of Acoustic Kitty, but they're, you know, animals are less likely to be noticed, particularly cats, right? If you're, you're if you made an acoustic doggy and someone saw a stray dog walking around, the likelihood is most of us would probably go, oh, who's the owner of this dog? Let me make sure I can get it and, and pay attention to it, you know, but a cat, you're not going to kind of do actually, you're not going to pay a lot of attention, it's particularly if you're in somewhere like Istanbul, where they thought this would be perfect. I could wander right into the Soviet compound and listen to everything we want to hear. Well, not all the stories in the, the book that involve animals rhyme with cat, but I do want to turn to one that does because you have an amazing story in World War II uh, about a plan that actually got tested at certain stages to use uh, the true patriots of America, and that's cave bats, and to somehow use them to end the war, perhaps not even needing to use atomic weaponry. Talk a little bit about that program and uh, what, what went wrong with the experimentation. Well, I mean, so, so some of these stories um, have been pretty widely told. I mean, Acoustic Kitty is something people have heard of, the bat bombs, or there's a book written about it by one of the guys who worked on the program. But what really interested me was how close these things actually got to going, becoming actual programs. Um, and, and bat bombs is one where the, the guy who came up with this idea, to the day he died, and he died decades later, swore this would have not only ended World War II as efficiently as atomic bombs did, but would have ended up with less Japanese casualties in the process. And, you know, I'm sure people in 1945 didn't care all that much about that, you know, but as we've gone on the decades, it would have been great to end that war faster and with less, you know, unnecessary killing, particularly among the civilian population of the Japanese. And the concept was let's affix bombs to bats and then drop them over Japan. And now that sounds relatively simple, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, it was the idea wasn't some guy at S and T of the OSS or wasn't an idea that was, you know, some military guy came up with it's actually a dentist of all people, uh, a dentist named Lytle Adams, uh, who, like most Americans, was listening to the radio on December 7th, 1941, and heard the story of America being attacked at Pearl Harbor. He happened, though, to be driving back from vacation. He went on vacation in New Mexico and he went spelunking on vacation and just had spent the last several days hanging out with bats and said, man, you know, this is kind of an opportunity. I now have kind of understood what bats can possibly do because he saw that they carried a lot of weight. And like, what if we could just affix bombs to bats and then drop them over Japan? Because something Adams also understood was that Japan of the 1940s was not like Japan of today where Japan of today is high-rise buildings and concrete and glass and other things. Japan in the 1940s, the vast majority of their cities, and their, well, cities is the wrong word, their, their villages, their towns, were made up of wood and sometimes even paper buildings and houses. So he said, all right, bats plus incendiary devices plus wooden and paper buildings, well, what do bats do during the daytime? 
Well, they immediately try to find a cold, dark, dank place to hide out. Well, an attic, an easement, a, a, you know, a nook and cranny is where bats will try to go. Well, where would that be in Japanese cities? Well, it would be attics and crannies and easements and, and nooks inside these wooden and or paper buildings. And if you affix a, a incendiary device to the bats, not great for the bats because they would be blown up in the process, but those patriotic bats will do their, you know, the purest sacrifice and burn Japan to the ground, essentially, uh, without any American casualties. And this is an idea that, you know, how did the dentist possibly get this information to the highest levels of U.S. government? Well, it turns out that Adams is also an inventor. In the 1930s, he invented a bunch of different systems for trying to make life easier. And one of them was actually a way to increase the speed of mail delivery coming from overseas. And he was a pilot as well. And so the idea was when the mail ship coming from Europe was several days away sailing, it actually was only several hours away by, by plane. And so you could fly out there in a plane and he created this concoction that allowed you to like hook the mail bag from the ship and bring it into the plane and fly it back. So it cut several days off of mail delivery and this is patented. And it was such an interesting idea that Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States, when she was traveling through Pennsylvania where Lytle Adams was living, popped out to check this out. It's like, this is an interesting idea. Let's go see what's going on here. And he actually gave her a demonstration of this in his plane. You can imagine what the Secret Service would do today if, if I, as a, like, a, let's say I'm a helicopter pilot, and I said, come on, Melania, jump onto the helicopter, and I'm going to fly you around. They would have had a conniption. Uh, at this time, though, it wasn't, I guess, such a big deal. Uh, and it helped that Lytle Adams actually apparently looked like Santa Claus. Older guy, big, chubby, you know, belly, white beard, had a jolly laugh. He probably played Santa every year, you know, around Christmas time. And the, the, whoever the security was for Eleanor was like, this guy is not a threat. So he flew around Eleanor, chatted with her for about an hour, showed her his, his actual interesting mail delivery invention. Uh, and then she went on her merry way. So when he had this bat bomb idea, he wrote to his old friend Eleanor in the White House and said, I've got this cool idea. And of course, Eleanor handed over to FDR. And FDR called Bill Donovan in as the head of the OSS and said, I've got this interesting idea. Check it out. And so Donovan took one look at it and said, this is just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But he had been ordered by the president to do something about it. So he handed it off to an organization called the OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research Development, which was the umbrella organization in charge of everything from the atomic bomb to radar development and everything else. And the OSRD put some guys on it. And the people they put on it were actually pretty smart. And they said, okay, let's see if this could actually work. So they went and they talked to bat experts. They went and talked to the guy who learned, who discovered what we all learned in third grade, that bats actually navigate through echolocation. And he had discovered that. And they went and talked to uh, explosive experts. Uh, the guy who actually invented napalm was someone they brought on. And they said, how much, how much of a punch can we create in a very small package so that it can be carried by a bat? And he's like, well, I just invented this thing called napalm where less than a pound of it will burn down a house. And they go, oh my God, we know bats and we have hundreds of millions of them that can carry about a pound worth of some kind of a cargo. And now you're telling us that we can put an incendiary device on there that will burn down a house that weighs less than a pound. Jesus, this idea might actually work. And so they tested it. And uh, this is where things kind of going off the rails. And, and it's, it's a comedy of errors. Uh, but not because the idea didn't make sense. It was because people just were publicizing tests they probably shouldn't have. The first one, uh, they gathered all these bats, uh, which is not hard to do because they're all over the place in the Western United States. And they put them inside a refrigerated truck uh, because the only way that you can actually take bats from point A to point B to test them is to put them in artificial hibernation. And the way you do that is to lower their body temperature. Brought them to the test site. They put them in these canisters. The idea was the canister would be dropped out of an aircraft. And then halfway down, the canister would open and the bats would fly out after they'd woken up from hibernation. But they miscalculated. They loaded all the bats into the canister and they dropped the canister from the plane. But the bats were still too cold to wake up from their hibernation. And so the canister full of hundreds of bats hit the ground at terminal velocity. And I don't care if you've got little wings. 
if you hit the ground at terminal velocity, that's not going to go very well for you. So test one ended up with a lot of squish bats. Test two, they they like, all right, well, we're not going to do this again. We're going to make sure that we can actually calculate correctly how much time it would be for the bats to get out of hibernation. So they, they gathered bats again, and they said, this time we're going to do it right. They had built on a airfield a mock-up of a Japanese town you know, with wooden and paper buildings. And they said, all right, well, the bats are going to go burn this town down. And so they brought the bats in hibernation. They opened the truck up and they fixed all of the incendiary devices on the bats while they were still asleep. And then they closed the truck back up again. And they said, let's heat up the truck so they can start waking up so we don't kill them all again. When they thought it was time and they calculated that the time the bats would be drowsy enough to be able to load them in, but they'd wake up, they opened the doors again they had miscalculated in the other direction. The bats were wide awake. And when they opened the doors, the bat just flew off in every single direction. Now, remember, they had already been affixed with their incendiary devices. The good news is half the bats flew directly to the mock-up of the Japanese town, went to the attics and nooks and crannies and easements of that town, and burned it to the ground. It worked perfectly. The bad news is the other half of the bats flew off to the working army airfield down the street. The hangars, the towers, the aircraft and burn that to the ground. Adding insult to injury, the commander of the airfield was not in the need to know of this top secret program. So when he showed up to try to put the fire out with the fire teams, they wouldn't let him in. So he had to stand there and watch his airfield burn to the ground. This would be the end of most programs. But there was a Marine general who very inauspiciously had joined the demonstration, didn't tell anybody he was there, he was in civilian clothes, watched this, probably in between laughing at the Army airfield being burned to the ground, this is the Marine General we're talking about, realized how much potential this program had. And so he moved it. He said, I want this program. Talk to this, the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations said, let's, let's fund this. Let's move this program over to the Navy and the Marine Corps can fund this. Because of course the Marines, if you remember, are the ones that are going to be doing all the island hopping and fighting their way in Iwo Jima and Okinawa and all these places and anything that can be done to make their life easier is something the Marine Corps was looking for. And so the Marines took this program over. It was given a new code name, Project X-Ray, and funding. And they, they did all the things you'd expect them to do. They made the incendiary devices more reliable. They, they discovered the exact time you needed to keep the bats in hibernation. And they, they had essentially the beta testing done. And so at this point, they needed to go and get a full allocation of funds to get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of bats to build the incendiary devices for them and to turn this into an operational program. I, I haven't told you what years there, this is going on, and I've done that on purpose because when the bat program was fully ready to rock, and when they went to the Chiba Naval Operations and said, we need several million dollars, you know, tens of millions of dollars to do this, was in July of 1945. When they went to the CNO, and they said, we've been working on this program out in New Mexico. Uh, we want money to keep it going. CNO was like, I thought you already had all the money that you needed for that. And he's like, we don't have money for the BAT program. The CNO was like, oh, that program in New Mexico. Because, of course, the chief of naval operations was in on what was happening at Los Alamos. And he said, I'm not giving you tens of millions of dollars for BATs. We have the solution to win the war. We just tested it in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And your program doesn't make sense. It's redundant. And instead of dropping hundreds of thousands of bats over Japan, we're going to drop one bomb. And in the end, we're going to drop two bombs. And so the reason this program was scrapped, the reason this program doesn't get the fully funding that it deserves is because of timing. If Lytle Adams program had been presented to the CNO in, let's say, February or January of 1945 or late 1944, there's a possibility that this would have been how the war ended and not the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, this counterfactual history, we have no idea, but Lytle Adams, to the day he died, he lived several more decades, said, my program would have been better. It would have been cheaper. It wouldn't have started a nuclear arms race in the Cold War. And at the same time, you would have had less Japanese civilian deaths because as they're, you know, that's the arguable one. If you know about the firebombing of Tokyo, that killed tens of thousands of Japanese civilians. And this would have caused the same basic idea but maybe people could have gotten out of the way and certainly can't get out of the way of an atomic blast. And so that bat bomb program, to me in the book, you know, there's, there's 21 stories in the book. This is the one that's the most feasible. This is the one that kind of says, you know what? 
I think it it worked. It just never got a chance to. Yeah. Vince, there's a, a question about this I've never asked you before, but obviously the atomic program was infiltrated by Soviet spies. Information about the program was getting to the Soviet Union. What about the bat bomb program? Do we have any indication that uh, the Soviets knew what was happening there? No. And, and what's interesting about that is that the infiltration of the Manhattan Project was, um, I, I would argue, and I do argue, uh, and it's not hard. No one really argues against this. But what we, we, we know for a fact is the Soviets were able to pick up on some very interesting open source intelligence that led them to key in on Los Alamos. And that, I mean, it was kind of common sense stuff. All, all of a sudden, the top atomic scientists in the country disappeared. You know, they're not teaching their classes at Berkeley or Chicago or anywhere else anymore. You know, it's, it's pretty obvious that the United States is working on something dealing with atomic physics. At the same time, they noticed that there were no journals, journal articles being written by all these top atomic scientists, that everything had been censored. And that wasn't true around the world. That wasn't true in other places where there are still articles coming out of the British and other places about atomic physics. All of a sudden, Oppenheimer and Fermi and Seaboard and everybody else, they're not writing journal articles anymore. At that point, they started saying, okay, where do these guys go? And there were train manifests. There were, there were you know, all of a sudden, everyone's going to Santa Fe on the train. Uh, and they were able to kind of track people to Los Alamos that way. My point is that these smaller programs were much more difficult to infiltrate because they just didn't know they existed, right? There weren't, it wasn't as huge. I mean, the Manhattan Project, you got to think about how much money was spent on it. $2 billion in 1940s money. So we're talking about hundreds and hundreds, basically the entire defense budget annually, if you've extrapolated that money. And we built three cities to create the atomic bomb. It's hard to miss that size of a program. Uh, and these were household names that these scientists that were being pulled into this program. So the Soviets, you know, would have been stupid not to have noticed what was going on. This bat program was smaller. Uh, Lytle Adams was a dentist. He wasn't a household name. Um, the other guys who were working on this still aren't household names. Uh, Louis Pfizer is not something that unless you're like a napalm enthusiast, you've heard of this guy before. Uh, and, you know, and so it was much more difficult to capture the open source intelligence to lead you to understanding that this was actually taking place. Fair enough. Um, so how did you get these stories? Just briefly, uh, what kinds of documents were available and how did you talk to people about some of these things that right. in some cases they had not talked about publicly much before? Yeah, I mean, declassification's gotten better. I mean, we're talking about World War II and the Cold War, so there have been things declassified in the last 10, 15 years that I was able to get my hands on. On top of that, digitization of these documents has been much, much better lately. Uh, CIA has, has digitized, well, somebody digitized it for CIA, the entire Crest program, uh, which, of course, was done after I finished researching my PhD and writing my other book. Um, that would have been very helpful if I could have sat on my couch and done it and not slipped to the National Archives. It's much, much easier nowadays to get this information. I actually made a point. There were stories that don't end, in this, end up in this book that certainly would have fit. The reason they're not there is the only thing available is stuff in the archive. And the reason I chose not to include them is I wanted to make this accessible to everyone. Uh, there's a reason I write in the style that I write in, which is first person, it's storytelling, it's not academic. And there's a reason I chose these stories is because you don't need to leave your house or your public library to get more information about them. So I, I, there's small vignettes, they're 10, 15 pages. I'm hoping I can whet the appetite of the reader. And, and so my actual bibliography and the notes at the end aren't giving you like lines from declassified documents you can only find in the archives. It's a list of where you can go on your couch or where you can go at the library to look at books and, and documents and other things that have been released that are easily accessible. So, you know, some people will say, well, that's not very scholarly. Well, this wasn't intended to be a scholarly book, right? If you want scholarly, the other book is footnoted and it's all over the place and you can only read about it in the archives. This was intended to be for everyone. Okay. And, you know, and so I, I, anyone who is still alive, I talk to. Um, anyone who is willing to talk to me and, and kind of hit me in the right direction, I certainly talk to. Uh, there's stories in here that I had to be very honest and saying, look, the real story here is still classified. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't working for any kind of government agency at the time. That really didn't matter to me. And so I, you know, I didn't break classification, but I told the story I could tell based on what was available to me. Right. Uh, and the great thing is a lot of these are, while they're still heavily redacted, there are thousands of pages available in the public now uh, about some of these stories. Uh, and so if you really want to know more about these, there's plenty of opportunity out there for you to, to dig deep. Um, you can be the only other human on the planet that's read the tens of thousands of documents on the Alaskan Stay Behind program. It'll be me and you if you want to go and read all these things. Like, I can't imagine anyone else has done it. Uh, yes. FBI and the Air Force has released so many documents on this program uh, that, uh, that are all online. Uh, so, you know, that's something that I really wanted to focus in on was make this to where if people wanted to know more information, they wouldn't have to do a lot of heavy lifting to get it. Let's um, let's hit one more story before we go. And this one will will leave the animals alone for a change. And we'll talk about people and one of the most I don't know. I don't know whether to say evil, um, but certainly one of the one of the programs you talk about that has some of the biggest ethical questions involved. And that's saying a lot because a lot of these stories have ethical yes. questions. Um, but this one is personal for you. This is Operation Northwoods. Uh, give a very brief sketch of Operation Northwoods, what was being planned right. and why it didn't happen. Well, a quick aside on this is, is when I was writing this book, um, my editor was iffy about whether or not some of these stories would, would work together. Mm -hmm. And so the first two stories I wrote were Acoustic Kitty and Northwoods because they are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. You know, one is jovial, ha ha, yes, you're killing some cats, but it's still a ridiculous story. Northwoods doesn't have a lot of funny in it. And it's one of these I almost didn't include in the book because there's a lot of conspiracy theory out there that's built around it. Right. And essentially what Northwoods was, was it was a plan that went, we think, it possibly to the president of the United States, but certainly as high as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who signed off on it. And it was a plan to essentially create a remember the main type incident or incidents that would create a a scenario which would look like the Cubans had attacked the United States following the Cuban Missile Crisis, which would give us a, a justification for invading and in, in taking out the cash regime. And in some cases, they weren't all that you know, devious. These aren't like bond plots. This was, again, blowing up a U.S. ship uh, in, in Harbor. This was kind of attacking Guantanamo or dressing up Cuban exiles as Cuban soldiers and attacking Guantanamo and just hoping no one died and, and, and making it an impetus for a war. But some of the ideas that were put forward were personally uh, an insult to me uh, because it certainly threatened uh, my well-being and my existence. Uh, some of them were actually creating, um, and this is where the whole false flag conspiracy nutsos come in, but this was suggested, uh, creating terrorist operations inside the United States in Miami and Washington, to blowing up aircraft flying from Miami to Washington, attacking places like the University of Miami and Miami, uh, uh, you know, shopping centers and other places as, you know, Cuban intelligence attacking, uh, you know, the Cuban exiles in Miami. Uh, and why this is a problem to me is, is literally my parents were dating at the University of Miami at the time. I was not even a twinkle in either of their eyes. Uh, and they were all the same places that these were suggested, you know, University of Miami, Coral Gables, Florida, all the places right near what is now, you know, Calle Ocho and where the little Havana places, my parents went there to eat it, Cuban food and other things. And you could see that they would have been in ground zero for some of these operations. Uh, and, and so you look at these and say, God, this is devious as hell. Some of these plans and some of them included things as far out as um, false, having fake funerals for real and or uh, fake bodies. You know, they got out of morgue, so it looks like they're burying American sailors or American soldiers. Uh, and all these programs came together through the idea of someone people have heard of, Edward Lansdale, uh, who becomes more infamous during the Vietnam period. Um, and what shocked me about this, and, 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 you know, is how high it got, right? There wasn't somebody, there wasn't some major at the Pentagon that said, we can't do this. This is ridiculous. No, it was signed off on all the way up through the ranks of the Pentagon, got to the White House, the Joint Chief of Staff, took a look at it and said, great idea. The chairman took a look at it and said, yeah, let's give this to the president. And then it appears as though it was briefed to the president. 
And the president said no. And so you get a little bit of, you know, faith in the system comes back a little bit, but it was because John F. Kennedy was the president. And, and, and you could argue counterfactually that he said no because he was an upstanding gentleman. We know he, he had his own issues. Uh, and, you know, and the, the cynical way of looking at that is, is he said no because he didn't want another Cuban debacle on his hands. And he was dealing with, uh, you know, the Soviets and everything else at this point. Um, but one way or the other, the system worked. Uh, and so, yeah, you can say the system worked, but God, how high did it have to get before the system finally kicked in? And decided to work is one of the things that really depressed me uh, as I've, I've read the story, as I looked at the documents behind it. Um, and this has been written about. I'm not the first one to bring this story down. It's written about if you, if you Google it and Google conspiracy theories, there's all sorts of stuff about Operation Northwoods. But more and more in the last 10, 15 years has been declassified. More of the people are willing to talk about it um, than ever were before. Uh, and so I, I, I was able to, I think bring an interesting perspective to it. Uh, a lot of it because of the way I wrote about it. Um, again, the first person kind of personal approach to it uh, brings it down to this isn't just a devious plot uh, that would affect no one. Uh, it's a devious plot that would affect a whole lot of Americans, uh, particularly people like my parents. Uh, and that, that kind of pisses me off a little bit. Yeah. Well, that's just one of the many stories in Nuking the Moon by Dr. Vince Houghton. Um, if you're interested in some of these stories and want some of those more scholarly things that Vince mentioned, he's also the author of The Nuclear Spies, a book which is uh, a little more academically rigorous um, and for those of you who are interested in that topic. And in the coming months, you'll be hearing more from Afio about uh, Vince's new project, which he may seek some assistance with from those of you in the audience. Um, Vince, thank you for sharing time with us. Thank you for sharing your research and your stories with us, and we do hope to see you again. Thank you, David. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, Vince has many more stories to tell. As some AFIO uh, members will recall, uh, Vince has actually appeared in several in-person uh, events of ours where he uh, presented his book, Soviet Spies. Uh, we will definitely get uh, Vince back on another occasion to talk uh, about some of his other publications. So thank you, gentlemen. It's been a very interesting session, and I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you.